What's up, everyone? Welcome to the latest episode of the Hash Key Learn series, where we speak to experts and professionals in the crypto industry to understand the most pressing and important subjects in the world of digital assets. Now, today I'm once again welcomed by my colleague Ben Albaz, head of ecosystems at Hashi Group, and today we are going to talk about liquid staking. Now, previously we had an episode with our colleague Dora from Hash Quark to break down what staking is, but today we are going to talk about another form of staking, which is liquid staking. Now, before we dive into um, liquid staking, Ben, can you? Um, you're a very busy man, so thank you again for doing this. Yeah, sure. No, yeah. yeah, always <laughs> so, fun. Always fun. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, um, can you tell us about your role at Hashkey and um, your previous experience in blockchain before we dive into liquid staking? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 Yeah. No. It's uh, it's been it's been quite a long journey, right? I think I was one of the one of the original employees of Hashkey back uh, you know, four four plus years ago. Mm. Kind of, uh, you know, this this whole space has been interesting and exciting to see to see it take off over these years. And like even before even before I got into the industry, it was you know a lot of a lot of stuff happened. I think my my first foray into the industry really came while while I was studying at Stanford. Uh, so while I was there together with a few other friends, you know, put together the university's largest like blockchain club. And uh, you know through that through that experience, right? I mean, the whole reason that I was interested in that was I spent. Uh, many years in open source software, okay. uh, and prior to that, you know, I was in the financial industry for for a little period of time, and uh, you know, I was looking at kind of the the overall applications of blockchain technology and how it could be used in a number of different industries. You know, I was always interested in kind of how how Ethereum was put together and kind mm. of how it launched as a as as an open source network, right? Mm. So decided back in those days to kind of you know to to go on with my time and uh, you know kind of kind of came across the great work that that Hashkey had been doing. Uh, in in the Ethereum community for for you know for many years before before I got started. Mm -hmm. Now I'm sure um, over the years you must have seen the amazing and very fast development of how blockchain came to be and how the current ecosystem came to be as well. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, um, you know the merge just happened uh, obviously. So and that signifies a new era of Ethereum as well as the crypto ecosystem. Now previously the first generation of blockchains always have relied on proof of work consensus mechanism. But, you know, ever since um, staking appears, staking has really changed how blockchain functions. Right. And with the merge, staking is the de facto way to go. I think, you know, before we dive into the limitations of staking and, yeah. and subsequently liquid staking, can you summarize in one sentence, what is liquid staking? Ben? Yeah, I think making illiquid assets liquid is essentially the way the way to think about it right mm -hmm. um i'm sure many people tuning into this have an understanding of what staking is right yep. like essentially this process of staking is instead of putting up compute resources which is what pow is right instead of putting up compute resources as your as your kind of you know show of faith deposit that you'll act nicely mm -hmm. to, to validate different transactions you actually put up money right so you kind of put this deposit up but those assets in that process become illiquid mm -hmm. right so if there are a way to do that process, contribute to that process, be a validator, and have your assets become liquid. You know, it's an it's a known brain no brainer for a lot of different uh, folks in the industry, right? So essentially, liquid staking is just this you know a new type of product that helps bring liquidity to illiquid assets. Mm -hmm. So basically, enabling capital efficiency for investors, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, before we get into the very detailed mechanisms of how liquid staking work, let's 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 get back. Um, let's step back for one second and maybe analyze what's the limitations of the classic way of staking that mm -hmm. prompted the rise of liquid staking. Can you maybe share some pain points? Yeah. No, I think so. You have to look at it really like blockchain by by blockchain, right? Because mm -hmm. every single different uh, POS blockchain has a different lockup mechanism, right? Yep. Um, so, for example, you look at something like Cosmos, Atom, like it has its own like certain number of days that that, you, that your tokens get locked up if you want to contribute to to validation, mm -hmm. right? With Ethereum, it's also different, right? Uh, with Polkadot, it's different. the The thing with Ethereum that is uh, much different and what has led to the growth of a lot of these liquid staking solutions is the fact that um, the way Ethereum staking works at this point in time is is you, if you lock up your tokens, you start staking them. You can't immediately destake them or, or withdraw them. You have to wait till this indeterminate period in, uh, of time in the future mm -hmm. to to do that. It is uh, you know has been you know was a drawback to a lot of different investors, right? Mm -hmm. So that pain point that created a, a market need 
for, for liquid staking solutions. Now let's dive a bit deeper into how exactly liquid staking works from a mechanism point of view. So let's say, so let's 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 take a hypothetical situation. Let's say let, let's use Ether as as the example, because I, I think that's also the birth of how liquid staking started. Uh, so let's say I have one ETH and I want to participate in liquid staking. How can I go about it with regards to liquid staking? Like sure. do I like after I stake, what happens next? Yeah, sure, sure. So you know, looking at a few solutions on the market, right? So you have Products like STETH, which have been developed by 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 Lido, Lido Finance, you know, decentralized community run run by a DAO, uh, you know, decentralized governance, and essentially you can you you can take one ETH, you you connect to the smart contract using using your wallet, MetaMask or whatever, and then you just you know submit a you know submit a request to to convert your your ETH mm -hmm. into into one STETH, mm -hmm. right? So that's what happens in the front end, right, to the to the user, right, and you get your your STETH. And then, kind of on a on a periodic basis, you know the that ETH which has been locked up in that process, it starts to be used by by validators in in the network uh, to generate staking rewards. And then you get that you get the the distributions. Your pro rata distribution gets gets sent to your wallet. You know every every period of time. On the back end, like what's actually happening is is the ether originally was in your was in your wallet, yeah. right? You transfer it to to a smart contract, mm -hmm. right? So you could transfer it to the you know, to the Lido smart contract or whatever, you know, prints you back this um, this STETH, and then from there your ETH still gets transferred onto from that smart contract to the the Ethereum blockchain's uh, official uh, Ether 2.0 like deposit contract, right? Mm -hmm. Where it sits there, it sits there until it's ready to be withdrawn, like you know, six or eight months in the in in the future. And then what also happens in that transaction is when your when your ether gets sent to that smart contract and then it gets sent on to the, the official deposit contract, mm. uh, there is like an assignment. There is a kind of metadata that gets sent in that transaction to assign a like a like an independent validator, someone who's running these validator nodes, uh, to 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 provide validation services for for that for that ETH. Mm -hmm. um, but for for the for the ether staking process actually needs to happen in in tranches of of thirty two. So um, that's led to the kind of the proliferation of some solutions that allow investors who might not have, you know, traders or users or whoever might not have 32 Ether to do this. Uh, so, you know, anyone can contribute with with lower, lower amounts, um, lower amounts of Ether to, to do that. So I think there's there's multiple benefits to, to liquid staking. One is like what we just talked about, which is capital efficiency, all that, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. The other is kind of fractionalization, right, which is in a, in a, in a state where the um, like the economics of the blockchain require you to, to lock up a certain amount, but you as just like kind of a normal user don't have that much capital, uh, you know, that can be broken down and you're allowed to kind of participate at a, at a, at a lower, lower minimum threshold. Mm -hmm. But no matter what the solution is, right, whether it's STETH, whether it's, you know, RETH, um, you know, behind this, you know, the front end, it's the same. You kind of, you kind of transfer over Ether and then you get back kind of a, uh, like a mirror asset, a wrapped asset from that. And behind the scenes, your ETH gets transferred onto the Ethereum deposit contract, and then there's a, a separate validator node, uh, a separate validator that's assigned to provide the, the validation services. So we can talk a little bit more about kind of validation on that mm -hmm. side or other other yeah. uh, other items. Now, once investors receive STETH or whatever liquid representation of their um, staked ETH is, what are something that they can do with that stake ETH in order to maximize their profit potential? Yeah, I think it really depends on it. Really depends on the user, right? Some folks just like having the liquidity and you know can mm -hmm. can sell if they want without having to wait for future future withdrawal dates. You know, if you follow the industry of the last six months, you know, there's kind of like you know the the the, the curse of liquidity sometimes is what it's referred to, right? Okay. Which is like you know assets like STETH because they you know because they're liquid and they can be used for many different usages. They tended to be kind of uh, piled up and pooled into different, you know, different lending pools and used for used for further further leverage. Okay. So I mean that you know, some of some of those issues that have happened in the industry are kind of related to you know parties like like Three Arrows and some of these some of these guys that really levered up heavy on that asset. But uh, but nonetheless, right? If you hold this asset, similar to any other similar to any other crypto asset, right? You could use it as collateral mm. to to borrow if you if you need it, right? Responsibly, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the process of kind of these these leverage loops can can lead to a little bit of uh, a little bit of risk. So you have to have proper risk management. But if uh, you know you're conducting yourself well, 
that just gives you like a new asset that you can use as, as collateral if, if for some reason you're, you're in need of you know, some type of you know, short-term cash or short-term USDC to, to do something uh, while you continue to stay, stay, the, stay long on the asset. Because you know, we see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of our partners, um, you know, given our history in the, in, in the Ethereum space, are very, very optimistic long-term on, on Ethereum, right? So they want to be holding the asset. Uh, and they also want to be participating in the staking process. So if you kind of put your assets on there, it's like buying a house, right? You you do that and you put put your assets in there. Yeah. But every you know at some point in the future, you might need access to short term short term cash. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can use your assets as collateral to maybe borrow borrow on a short term basis if there's some you know some pressing cash cash need mm-hmm. you have, but you can still stay long on the asset. Now a recent report by Consensus has indicated that. As the merge drew closer, more and more institutions, custodians, and organizations have been participating in um, staking. Now, why do you think now is the time that institutions have finally realized, you know, the benefits of staking and have decided to get into sure. um, this? Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a great it's a great question, yeah. right? Um, I think the biggest thing that we've seen over the past the past year or so is. You know, the solutions that I was just talking about, things like STETH, they've been very, very effective at kind of the retail level. But that said, you know, given the way that DeFi works, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a knock on DeFi. It's just the way that it is. You know, generally speaking, there's there's no, uh, you know, no implementation of, of KYC or AML. Yeah. And, you know, for some folks, that's, you know, that's that's a positive thing. But for for institutions who are regulated and licensed, they can't necessarily deal, you know, deal, deal in that environment. So, you know, we've seen a lot of institutions who, uh, you know, a lot of institutional partners who have started, you know, investing in crypto assets probably two or two or three years ago, maybe starting with Bitcoin first because they, they understood the narrative. But then more recently, they, you know, these types of investors and these types of institutions have been really taking a very, very serious look at, at Web 3.0 and kind of the future of all these new types of business models, uh, you know, based on that big trend. And a lot of folks see Ethereum as, you know, kind of this this next generation infrastructure that's going to really have the, the potential to power, uh, you know, web, web 3.0 applications. Now, uh, so, you know, long story short, a lot of these institutions are looking into, you know, longing, long ETH, long, mm-hmm. long term, yep. where they buy in, like those price points, who, who knows, right? Each, each firm makes their own decisions. But think about it, right? If you want to go, go long Ether and you're, and you're not staking, you're basically earning kind of like a, a negative, <laughs> you know, negative real rate of return, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Because if you don't stake, then... You're you're missing out, you know. You're missing out on that um, on that on that yield. If let's say you know I'm a, I'm a professional investor or an institutional investor, and I want to participate in liquid staking, mm. what are some of the features or qualities I should look for in a staking service provider? Mm. Um, you know, if I want to do um, staking. Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's a yeah. question we get, we you know, we get all the time, which is, you know, how should I be evaluating the risks in, in this space? Exactly. And yeah. um, I think we really look at it across, you know, several different areas, right? You've got, you know, you have to look at kind of the, the you know, the credit risk of, of the counterparty. You have to look at the operational risk. You have to look at, you know, liquidity risk and, and, and these types of, you know, these, these types of things, right? Standard kind of like risk risk management approaches. I think when we look at, and there's also market risk, right? So I think, you know, if you look at, let's take market risk, for example, right? All these solutions are generally going to have the same, the same level of market risk because they're all exposed to kind of underlying you know, ETH fluctuations, right? Uh, I think the biggest area of difference between all these different products is is, is the the operational risk assessment, right? Like mm-hmm. who's who's actually running the product? Like who are the developers? You know, what what security measures have they put in place? How was the smart contract audited? Beyond the smart contract audit, like how else has the entire you know key management process? You know, has that process been you know internally reviewed or externally reviewed? Right. So there's a lot of, um, you know, operationally, there's a lot of potential like nuanced things that, that can go wrong, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, from an institutional point of view, you really need to be either you need to trust the, you know, the counterparty that you're working with. And if they're licensed and regulated, yep. maybe you have a certain level of confidence that they'll be, you know, managing some of these operational risks mm-hmm. or you, you know, you need to be savvy enough to really dig in, dig into the details and do that risk mm-hmm. assessment uh, your, yourself. I think on the the liquidity risk side of things, of course, you know these are, you know this is not this is not ETH, right? It's a uh, you know it's a different it's a converted version of ETH that kind of builds in the the staking rewards. So it will have a different liquidity profile compared to kind of the like the base the base asset. To manage the liquidity risk, many different ways to do that, right? You could do 
you know, you can do an off-platform trade, you know, you could do an on-platform trade, you know, you could you could break it out over over a period of time. So besides those um, you know, those factors, those typical like financial risk assessment factors, mm-hmm. right? There's also like the regulatory risk, which is a big uh, regulatory and compliance risk part of it, which is a big a big component for for, mm-hmm. for institutions. So some of the some of the retail friendly products out there, uh, they're good. They they work they work quite nicely. You know, they've already developed a certain level of, of scale. I think like STTH, for example, you know, about thirty percent of uh, you know the the liquid staking market. I think they're you know they're they're one of I think they have like thirty percent market share or something. Uh, but you know, honestly, a lot of these big institutions can't you know can't necessarily hold that hold that asset on their books if they if they don't know who they're transacting with. Right. So some in some cases, there may be ways to um, to, to mitigate those risks. But I think, you know, from a lot of the institutions that we've been dealing with, right, by, you know, by not really understanding, like, how the, the security process for some of these products are, are designed and like who who has control over the wallets and, you know, are those people really trusted? I think institutions are what we're seeing. Right. It might not be true for all like clients and counterparties like what we're seeing. What we're seeing is that. You know, institutions want to basically face uh, one company whose processes, whose internal controls and procedures they, you know, they 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 trust. But you know, likewise, right on the other side of the fence, we see a lot of like independently, you know, wealthy investors who are saying, okay, I'm okay to hold, you know, uh, you know, an asset that's 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 issued by you know, kind of a decentralized DAO and things like that. I think I think it really depends really depends on on the user, right? Thank you again for a very insightful oh, yeah. interview conversation. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Always. Yeah. So um, if you guys are watching this on uh, YouTube, uh, please feel free to leave a like, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys.